In the summer of 1965, a butcher living in Nebraska received a strange parcel in his mailbox. And just down the road, a wheat farmer, also in Nebraska, received the same parcel. So did a, a lawyer, an accountant, and in fact, almost 300 other people. What it contained was this. This parcel had some instructions in it. In particular, it gave the name of a stockbroker living in Boston, Massachusetts, quite far away from where they lived. And the instructions were to pass this parcel via acquaintances that you know on first name terms only and make sure that it gets to its recipient. The person who set this up was a social scientist called Stanley Milgram, most famous for his prison experiment, but this was his other great contribution. And the idea was that he, he anticipated that you'd be able to get from Nebraska to Massachusetts in a few steps. He asked around, and it turns out, if he, if he asked some of his colleagues at Harvard University, they estimated somewhere between 100 steps, perhaps 1,000 steps. Remember, these are people that you only know on first name terms, people you would consider relatively close acquaintances. The parcel also contained some postcards and a little roster. So as people received this parcel, they were supposed to write their name on the roster to make sure it didn't loop back to them later on, and also to send a postcard back to Stanley Milgram to say that they've received it and they're passing on the parcel. Now, not all of the parcels made it there, but a surprising number did. And in fact, when they started to look at how many steps it was, they were very surprised to find that the average number of steps was somewhere between five and six. So that's where the idea of six degrees of separation comes from. This original experiment in the 1960s, which suggested that we're only six steps away from other people all around the world, if we only knew the best people to ask. About 30 years later, there was a math professor called Stephen Strogatz at Cornell University who was walking home uh, and listening to the crickets in Ithaca, upstate New York, as per usual. And it got him to thinking, all of a sudden, the crickets seem to surge and fade at the same time. It's something that we've all experienced in Singapore as well. Well, how did they synchronize themselves over such a large area? And so the next day, he went in and he sat down with his graduate student, a guy called Duncan Watts, uh, very much at the start of his career, and they started to attack this problem. And they thought, well, it's not possible for the crickets to only be listening to their immediate neighbors because the phenomenon seems to spread so incredibly quickly. And that just wouldn't happen if it was only local connections. Nor can it be completely random. They're not just randomly listening to another cricket because then it would be completely chaotic. So what they needed to find was some middle ground in between completely regular and completely random. And they produced this paper, which has been called a seminal paper that launched a 1,000 academic careers. It's actually very short, very readable, thoroughly recommended. It's called The Collective Dynamics of Small World Networks, and it came out in the late 1990s. What they did in this paper is they abstracted the problem out completely. Instead of worrying about crickets or even people trying to send messages, they started with just dots and lines. Now, this is from a branch of maths called graph theory, where we try and represent connections without thinking too much about what they represent. You've seen graphs all over the place. Anytime you go on the MRT, the MRT map is a graph. It's got a load of dots for the stations. It's got lines for the, for the train lines traveling between them. And the model they started off with was one that was very, very well understood at the time, the completely regular graph. Here, everyone is absolutely identical. Everyone is connected to everyone else. Everyone has exactly four friends. That sounds like quite a lot to a math teacher, but anyway. Um, but unfortunately, this is not a good model for the phenomenon that they were studying, because it's so local. Although you can make your way all the way around, it takes a lot of steps. And so that rapid transition that they were observing, or the six degrees of separation, just wouldn't occur in something like this. So starting from this very, very simple model, they looked at two specific criteria. One is how clustered they are. How many of my friends also know each other? If I have four friends, like I say, that sounds like a lot, then there could be, in theory, up to six connections between them. But here, for those of my four friends, there are only actually three links. So it's roughly 50% of the total connections that we might be able to see. The other thing they were looking for is the average path length, how long it would take to send a message from someone on one side to a random dot somewhere else on the, on the map. Uh, and for this network, because we've got not many nodes, because there are not many connections, it takes an average of four steps, even for this tiny little network. Imagine building that up to a network of 8 billion people, each of whom have 150 to 200 friends. You can see how the numbers would grow incredibly quickly. 
So what they did is they started to amend this model gradually, and in a random way. They needed to introduce some disorder. So they started to pluck at some of these strings. And it turns out, if you simply take one at random, and you rewire it again at random, we don't want to loop back to ourselves, although we should always love ourselves, we don't want to see that on the graph, you can reduce the average path length quite quickly. The number of clusters stay pretty clear. I'm still friends with a lot of my neighbors, with all of my old friends, but now I've got this global link that takes me across in one step. Do it again, you do it again, and you start to get something that really feels like a small world network, our kind of social networks of close friends, but also the occasional random friend who no one else knows, who brings you into another group. And that's what they christen them, the small world network. You can see that what's happened is the average path length with only a few more nodes, with only a few more links, is now down to under three, but it's still fairly clustered. We still have that local experience of knowing lots of friends and them kind of knowing each other. If you tweak this more and more and more, if you go from complete order, complete regularity over on the right-hand side there, down to complete randomness on the left, what you find is the, ch the chance of you picking a particular link to rewire it means that the path length, those blue dots, comes down very, very quickly, while the clustering remains quite high. And so you're able to walk that gap between regularity and randomness, exactly what they were finding as they studied all of these real-world networks. One key example of that are these handsome fellows. These are nematode worms, the C. elegans worm. The nice thing about this is that they don't have many neurons, and they're very well understood by biologists. So you can study exactly what happens. You can see how those pathways are created. And it turns out that their uh, brain pathways do form exactly the sort of small world model that they saw in their example. Lots of clustering, but also these global links that allow information to travel very far. Another classic example is the way that energy is generated and transmitted around the USA. This was mentioned in their paper too. You have that local nature, small links, but also a global nature, the ability to jump across the USA in one fell swoop. Perhaps the most famous version of this is the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game. I'm sure we've all played this at some point watching a film, where you lean on the fact that the collaboration graph of Hollywood actors is once again a small world. Lots of people have worked with each other, they work with other films, and so that brings in a whole new realm of, of people that we are connected with. And in fact, even geographically, we know that the world is now smaller than it's ever been before. Look at these transport clusters, look at the hubs that we have. We can get from anywhere on the globe to almost anywhere else in only a few hops on a plane or a train or an automobile or something like that. So why do these networks keep cropping up and up and up? Why do we see them all the time? Well, one, energy might, well, one answer might be something to do with the energy it takes to create and maintain these links, whether they're social links, whether they're geographic links, whether they're financial links or internet-based links. It takes a lot of energy. Small worlds are incredibly efficient. We don't actually need to have lots of links in order to make the world feel small, to make us all feel very close to each other. And that's why these things develop naturally in nature, in our social networks, in our work networks, and so on. They're also incredibly resilient. Because what we have is a lot of local connections and a few global connections, it means that we can easily take out one node, some individual gets removed for some reason, perhaps someone is having a little bit of a, of a crisis in a maths exam or something like that, and so they're removed from the social group. Well, the network still stays strong. People can still communicate with each other. All of those links still exist, and it's very, very resilient to any kind of attack, any change from outside. Of course, that resilience also means that it can be quite problematic. We've seen the spread of pandemics, diseases. They really take, they, they absolutely flourish in our small world. And that extends to the digital world as well. Digital viruses moving around. Even in our social networks, when we have malicious gossip going around, perhaps bad stock news, something like that that's going to affect our company, it travels around the world so quickly because of these small worlds. It doesn't take many jumps to reach anyone around the world from where, the, where it all originated crucial to all of this is what are called weak links. So we have our very strong links. We have our really good friends. We have our friends that we see every day. Perhaps these are the neurons that are close to one particular neuron as it's firing. Perhaps these are the people that we work with all the time. But also, we have these weak links that we've developed, perhaps by going to a conference, by meeting someone else, by going on a camp. And those are the links which really give rise to the small world existing. And those are the links that it's very easy to ignore. We see our friends from day to day. Everything nearby is very easy to maintain, but those weak links are the ones that really extend our network beyond what we might expect otherwise. Now, 
If we go back to Duncan Watts, who was the graduate student working with Stephen Strogatz, he, he came out with a warning. And he said this. Um, Although we're in a geographically global world, we evolve very much in terms of small social structures. And so it's incredibly difficult for us to envisage what happens as we move beyond our immediate friendship group. We care a lot about our friends. We sort of care about our friends' friends, but more than two links, and all of a sudden, that's just some random person. And so all of these issues, but also all of the benefits, are often very blind to us. We can't see what's going to happen. Humans are historically not good at estimating what happens when we have exponential growth. We're not good at saying what's going to happen as our actions ripple out through our small world network. And so that's something to bear in mind, not only when it comes to negative things like epidemics or, or bad actors, but also when it comes to the positivity that can come about by doing a single good action. Perhaps there's just the joy in human communication, knowing that you're connected with people who are geographically distant from you. Perhaps it's all the good you can do by introducing people to new ideas by using the tools of social mobilization to make sure that people, even if they're geographically distant from you, are still focusing on the same issues, are worrying about the same injustices, are aware of the same current events that are happening in your world. Now, historically, people are not really aware of this network, and that's a problem, because it's there. And if we're only six degrees away from each other, then there's a lot that can be done, both positive and negative. So what I'd encourage you to do in the future, anything you do, think about how close you are to all of our neighbors, all of our friends, what the small network looks like for you and the people that you're close to. Thank you very much.